Well, welcome back. It is Wednesday, September 16th, 2020. My name is Dan Kaufman, and I serve as Director for Discipleship and Assimilation here at Harris Chapel. And we are just thankful that you're checking in to our Wednesday midweek gathering here online, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook. We're glad you're here. And if you've been following along the last couple of weeks, we've kind of been hopping around in different uh, chapters in the book of Matthew. And we're going to continue with Matthew tonight. But this series that we're about to start is going to lead us into some other books as well. And we'll get to those in a little bit later. But tonight we're going to be in Matthew 5. And that's where we ended a couple of weeks ago. If you remember, we were talking about the Beatitudes and we were talking about salt and light. Well, this series, we're going to be talking about, are you a good neighbor? Are you a good neighbor? And what does that mean? What does neighbor mean? And, and this word pops up multiple times throughout both the Old and New Testament, and then several times in Matthew. But we're going to talk about it in Matthew 5 here, uh, where Jesus is doing another teaching. And so uh, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and flip over to Matthew chapter 5. That's where we're going to be. But I want to do a quick recap of what we talked about two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we talked about uh, the start of Matthew 5, the start of the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, where Jesus was laying his expectations, his characteristics, those things that he wants his disciples, his followers to embody. And that's the way they are to act, and it's to shape the way they view people, view things, and, and everything about that. And then once they have done that, they become his salt and light because they're living up to those characteristics that he expects them to embody. What a serious call to righteousness. And if you remember, each week as we've been working through Matthew, I've been saying that as Jesus is coming, as he's beginning his ministry, as he's preaching, and all these things, he's changing the customs, he's changing the norms, he's flipping everything upside down, and he's saying, you know what, watch this, I've got something new for you. And we see this again at the end of chapter 5. So the beginning of chapter 5 was the Beatitudes, and Jesus is like, I'm going to twist everything you know, this is how you're supposed to act. And then he's going to do it again at the end of chapter 5, so we're going to be in verses 43 through 48. And again, Jesus is saying, hey, this is what you've been taught. This is what you're thinking. This is what's accepted. But I'm going to tell you that, that that's no longer good enough. This is how followers of mine, this is how disciples of, of mine are to act. And so if you have your Bibles, again, verse 43 through 48, I want to read this to you because it's, it's so good. And this passage is titled, Love Your Enemies, or Love for Enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor. And hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect, therefore, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we're going to be talking about a couple therefores tonight, uh, Jerry, if you're watching. But uh, as I said, each week we're talking about all these things where Jesus is tied down. He said the way that uh, his disciples had been taught in the past. And so in verse 44, he says, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. So Jesus is teaching his followers that it is no longer accepted to hate anyone. Not even your enemy. You know, it doesn't say anywhere in the Old Testament that it's okay to hate your enemy. That's not, that's not what it says. But it was at this time an accepted practice to hate your enemy. It was a common thing. And, and, and you know, you could even say that uh, today in today's world that it's okay to hate your enemy, that you'll hear people saying that, oh, I disagree with this person politically, or I, or I, you know, I just can't understand why they see this this way. But what is Jesus saying right here? Even your enemy, you were to love. Even your enemy, you were to pray for. Pray for those who persecute you, right? And so this is this call to love that Jesus is sh shaping, right? He says at first in the Beatitudes, all of the things that he wants us to embody. And then he ends this chapter right here in, in the recount that Matthew gives. And by the way, Matthew was a tax collector. So when he calls out tax collectors there, it's kind of interesting. But Jesus is saying right here, right now, that what you've been doing, what's been accepted in the past is no longer okay. That I am coming, I am showing God's perfect love because I am here and what I'm going to do at the cross because God's perfect love is manifested in Jesus Christ. And that is how we are to treat others and view others. And so this call to perfect love, this call to love everyone, not just our neighbor, not just those that we have things in common with, not just our friends, not just our family, but to truly love everyone, including those who harm us, our enemies, those who persecute us. We are to love them. Them, that Jesus calls us to pray for those who persecute us, to pray for those who persecute us. 
and, and as I was reading this and I was studying this, and Pastor Jim's been doing this awesome study on the Lord's Prayer. If you don't watch his early risers, you need to get up early or watch it later on in the day or whatever. But you need to check it out because he's, bre he's breaking down the Lord's Prayer and what that does. Because when you pray, when we pray to God, something happens. Something happens. And so we are changed, right? When we pray for those who persecute us, we're praying for them. But guess what? We're not praying that they will be changed. We're praying that we will be changed, right? So prayer aligns us with God's will, right? Very in Matthew chapter six, which we'll get to later on that, you know, in the Lord's prayer, God's will be done. His will be done. So when we're praying, we are aligning ourselves with God's will. So guess what? We can't see that person that we're praying for the same way we just saw him before. It's impossible, right? So when we pray for people, we see people as a part of the very same creation of God that we are, right? We see them as needing Jesus just as we do. We see them needing redemption and a savior and all of these things that we experience in our lives as Christians, as followers of Christ. We see them needing that as well. So when we pray for our enemies, it isn't that they change. It's that we change. You know, I started this in, in my own daily prayer and in, in, in my prayer life. You know, if there's somebody that I, I disagree with or somebody has something that uh, they're very passionate about and they're sharing it with me, I just pray for God's eyes, his ears, and his heart so that I see my neighbors as God sees them. Let, let me share this with you, what I've learned from praying for people like this. It is impossible to pray for someone and still hate that person. Let me read that again for you because this is, this is good. And there's the therefore, J Jerry, that we can deduct from this verse, right? It is impossible to pray for someone and still hate that person. Because if we're truly praying to God for that person, if we're truly saying, you know what, God, I need to see this person as you see them, we are aligning ourselves with God's will. And, and I can tell you right now, God doesn't hate them. So if we're aligning ourselves with God's will, mm, you, you can't pray for someone and still hate them. Because otherwise you're not praying that, that, and you're aligning yourself with God's will. Challenging thought, I know it, but we're reading it right here in scripture. So when we challenge ourselves and we say, you know what, maybe I disagree with this person about our job or, or whatever, fill in the blank there, pol politics or this movement or, or whatever. When we pray for that person, it's not that, hey, that person needs to see things the way I see them because I'm right. I'm right. No, Father, help me see that person as a child of yours. Help me see that person as somebody who needs you, Jesus. Help me. Change me. You know, it, it's pretty interesting that the that it says you'll be sons of your father in heaven. If you hop back to the beginning of chapter 5, remember that's where we started with the Beatitudes. In verse 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons or children of God, depending on what translation you have. Well, let's use children here. So, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. Guess what, friends? Praying is a weapon for peace. Praying is a weapon for peace. Again, this is where Jesus is saying, you know what? Everything that you've thought, everything that, that, that you know about weapons, everything that you're expecting for your, for your Savior, for the Messiah to do, I'm going to say, ah, no, peace. Peace. Praying is a weapon for peace. Jesus, again, is he's just changing these norms. He's changing these expectations that, that, that the people have, and they're like, Wait a minute. What what is going on? You know, for so long I, I I've I've hated those those that aren't that are in my tradition. And Jesus is saying no no no. And in doing so, what is Jesus doing? He's making everyone his neighbor. You know, as we read later on in in, in the New Testament, Paul talks about eh, everyone being grafted into that same vine as the Israelites. Guess what? That means everyone is your neighbor. Everyone is your neighbor. So not only are you to love your neighbor, you're to love your enemy. But in fact, your enemy is your neighbor. And I'm talking about, you know, uh, a neighbor is a spiritual term here. So if any of my actual local neighbors are watching, you guys are great neighbors. I love having you as neighbors. I'm super blessed to have you as neighbors, and I, and I hope you are watching. But as we continue on in this passage, it's, it's really interesting because this word perfect comes up. And a lot of people get hung up on this word. A lot of people will sit there and say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't like this word. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not going to, you know, whatever. It causes them to hang up. But when, when the author is writing here, he says, don't be like the tax collectors and pagans. And what he's saying is to love everyone, right? If you go back and you look at, at the pagan tradition, um, it, was a, it was a very tight sect cultural 
uh, click, I guess it would be another word you could call it, right? And so outsiders were viewed as enemies, right? Tax collectors, everyone viewed the tax collectors as enemies at that time, and tax collectors viewed everyone else that wasn't paying their taxes or even those that probably were paying their taxes as an enemy. But, but the author saying, you know what? Hey, don't be like that because Jesus is saying to love everyone. Therefore, there's another therefore, Jerry, therefore be perfect. And if you watch Pastor Jim's message from this past Sunday, we, we studied the word as and how that means, you know, this and that as your heavenly father is perfect. And so don't let that, that word hang you up because this is what Jesus is saying right here. He's saying that in my perfect love, I am God's perfect love manifested here on earth. I am giving you the example of what love is. I'm giving you the example of what God's kingdom is is right love peace he's giving us that example so we are to live in that perfect love just as jesus gave the example again friends it's impossible to pray for someone and still have the previous view you had of that person i'm just gonna i'm just gonna throw that out there because if you're truly praying for that person you're not praying that they see things the way you see them you're not praying that they necessarily change to be more like you you're praying that you change to be more like jesus that you see them as a part of god's kingdom that you see them as a part of god's creation that needs redemption if you're not saying amen you probably should be right there so remember the serious call to righteousness that jesus was giving his disciples in the beatitude this is that same high standard that perfect love that he's ending with here in chapter five it's that same high standard that God has for us. There's no half stepping in this, friends. This I, I, I want to encourage you and, and, and help you get motivated for this because I found some, some intense motiv motivation in this passage that we can't, as Christians, as followers of Christ, uh, we can't settle for halfway. We can't. I can't say, you know what, I'm going to be friends with this person because they have the same hobbies as me, and I, I'm only going to love this person because they have the same political views as me, and I'm only going to love this person because they also like Bavarian Bismarcks. No, no, no. Jesus is telling me I've got to love the same person that loves a jelly donut too, right? I've got to love everyone because Jesus came for everyone. Everyone. That includes our enemies. That includes those of different backgrounds. That includes those of different cultures. That includes those of different nationalities. That includes those that disagree with us politically. Are you listening, friends? Jesus came for everyone, and in his teaching at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, he's expecting us to love everyone in the way that he loves everyone. As he manifested that perfect love, as he is God's love here on earth, showing us the kingdom of heaven, showing us what snapshots of heaven are like, he expects us to embody that and us to live that out as we go about our lives. You know, a couple weeks ago I shared that, you know, once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, that individual type of lifestyle kind of ends there, right? It's no longer, hey, this is – I had an instructor share this with me, and it's so good. It's no longer this, hey, it's just Jesus and me, and everything's, everything's great. No, it's Jesus and me and you and you and you and you. Right. Because I want I want the Holy Spirit to be so so at work in my life that it's oozing out of me that whoever I come in contact with is saying, hey, what what is going on? Right. This is a love I don't know. This is a love I haven't experienced. And that that right here, what Jesus is teaching right here is what he's calling us to do. So when he says perfect love, he's saying, hey, just just follow me. I'm giving you the examples right here. I'm telling you what to do right here. And here's the best part, friends. It's for everyone. If you're watching tonight. Jesus's love is for you. If you're a Christian, you are to love everyone, just as Jesus loves everyone. You know, go to John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, world, that he gave his one and only son. Jesus came for the world. If you're watching this, you're, you're on the world wide web. Therefore, you're a part of the world. Good news, friends. Jesus came for you. Jesus loves you. And as Christians, we are to embody that same perfect love for you. Christians, don't settle for halfway. Don't say, hey, you know, I, 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 I'm great with all these people and I do all these things and everything, but those people over there, mm, I'm just not going to do it. <clears throat> Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you because in that prayer, in that prayer, it's a weapon for peace. And we're praying that God changes our hearts, our eyes, our ears, our mouths so that it's more like Jesus. So we see them as God sees them. I can't see somebody the same way after I pray for them. It's impossible. I can't 
because now I'm praying that God changes me so that I see them as somebody who needs God, somebody that needs redemption, somebody that needs a savior. Praise his name. I'm getting excited. All right, next one. Loving your neighbor. This idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, it, it's not new, right? You go back to Levitical law, chapter 19, verse 18, it talks about, you know, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, right? And we're going to see that we're going to be in Romans and Ephesians, Matthew, uh, two other chapters in Matthew, and again in Luke here in the next couple parts. So this idea isn't something new. You know, the, the disciples had heard this, love your neighbor. But the way in which Jesus is explaining this and, and the way we're going to see it explained throughout the rest of the New Testament, this is different, friends. This isn't just love your neighbor. This is, this is the standard that Jesus is calling us to. And when Jesus came, again, he made everyone your neighbor. So there's nothing you can't – Jesus isn't going to accept anything less than us loving. Did you hear that? Jesus isn't going to accept anything less than us loving everyone because he has made everyone our neighbor. Not loving everyone isn't the model Jesus teached. Jesus taught that we should love just as he loved. Perfect in love as Jesus is perfect love. I'm going to give you a snapshot for next week because this is if you want to read ahead because we're going to continue with this idea of are you a good neighbor? Are you loving your neighbor the way that you should? So next week we're going to be in, in Matthew chapter 22 and Luke 10. And if you're familiar with that, that's the two greatest commandments. And uh, I'm really, really excited to share that with you. But it, as we do each week's friends, if you don't know this perfect love, if you don't know the fact that Jesus came to die for your sins, if you don't know that Jesus loves you, I want to invite you to step into a relationship with him because here's the good news. Here's the good news. Are you ready? Jesus came for you. He came for you. If you're watching, he wants to redeem you. He wants to walk in a close standing relationship with you. For God so loved the world. The world. Everyone. Everyone. That Jesus came and that he died for our sins, that whosoever believes in him, all life with him. Eternal life, friends. Eternal life filled with perfect love. I'm so thankful that Jesus came and manifested God's perfect love to show us how to live, to show us how to love. I'm so thankful for that. So if you're ready to know Jesus, if you're ready to experience the relationship that'll change all of your other relationships, because you're truly going to learn what love is, say these words with me. And if you're a Christian already and you're saying, you know what, Dan, I, I need to be reminded that uh, I am to embody love to every single person that I meet, that every single person is my neighbor, and that when Jesus came, he expects me to love everyone. He expects me to pray for those I disagree with. He expects me to pray for those who give me a hard time, or those who persecute me, those who are violent towards me, whatever. If you need to be reminded of that, it's okay to say these words too. Each day is a choice to follow Jesus Christ. Let's make that choice tonight too. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask for forgiveness for my sins. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my old life and invite you to come into my life and to be the Lord of my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Savior. And Jesus, as I do each week right now, I just pray for Christians, Lord. I just pray for those who are already walking with you, that they are full and confident in their faith, and that they embody those things that you taught us, that they say, you know what? I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to pray for those who persecute me. God, give me your eyes. Give me your ears. Give me your heart so that I see everyone the way that you see them, Father, that I see people that need you, that I see people that need redemption, that I see people that need Savior. Lord, help me be your mouthpiece. Lord, help me love in the way that you love. I'm so thankful for you, Jesus. I'm so thankful for what you did for us. And I'm thankful for the example and the callings that you give us in that calling and perfect love. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you, friends, as always, for your time. I love sharing these things with you. Again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22 and Luke chapter 10 next week. So if you want to read ahead, um, go ahead and hop over there. But I also want to tell you that this Sunday, if you're in the East Central Indiana area or even Ohio, we are having our Old Fashioned Day here at the church. So that is like, you know, the, one of the biggest events here at the church every year. And uh, it's a big ordeal. We're going to have some old tractors out here. There's going to be some games throughout the woods, safe social distance. It's going to be awesome. And uh, there's going to be a band. It's going to be a phenomenal time. Everything's outside. Everything's outside. So I would love to encourage you to uh, come and celebrate with us and uh, just hear the word on Sunday morning. We'll see you guys then.